Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all. And um, while Mark is doing that, let me just introduce myself. My name's Chris Gessling. Um, I'm head of programmes here at the Inns of Court College of Advocacy. And I'm absolutely delighted to uh, welcome our guests and panellists on this session. Uh, first of all, uh, Kalia Laikugu from Doughty Street Chambers. Uh, welcome, Kalia. It's lovely to see you. It's lovely uh, to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Tom's Wolf, Tom Walsfold, who is at Lincoln House Chambers in Manchester. Hi, guys. Nice to meet you all. And uh, Malka uh, Afzal, uh, who is a pupil barrister at Nine St John Street in uh, Manchester. And I do hope that at some stage uh, we'll be able to see as well as hear uh, from uh, Malka. Uh, yes. The whole uh, concept today is about pupillage and success in obtaining pupillage. And I'm perfectly aware, of course, for all of us that have been through that process, that it's the sort, it's the driving force, of course, behind why you're doing your, your bar training. That's your focus. And of course, your end game is to get a tenancy at the chambers, hopefully, that you do pupillage at. But it's the thing that strikes up fear into the hearts of all of us. Actually, what is it? What's that process actually like? Now, uh, for me, it was a long, 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 long time ago. Um, but uh, for Kalia and Tom and Malka, it wasn't so long ago. And all of them have got uh, really interesting stories and experiences. And really, it's that authentic experience that we wanted to bring to this session uh, for you all. OK, you can please type in questions during the session, uh, the chat in session uh, box, and we'll try and answer your questions as you go through. But I really hope that through the, throughout this process, the majority of questions you have about uh, pupillage, the application process and the interview process uh, will uh, be answered for you. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start, uh, first of all, with Kalia, if I, if I may. Um, in fact, let me say this, Kalia, uh, before I even move on to the question. You have recently been awarded uh, Inspirational Woman of the Year Under 35 by the First 100 Years Project. Yes. That, that's yeah. a, a, what a wonderful achievement. Congratulations. Thank you. I'll remember it when I'm 36. <laughs> uh, I feel most pleased about that. I think. <laughs> OK, um, let's we'll get into the detail about your, your, your journey, if you like. I promised myself I wasn't going to use that word journey, but I have it done. It's over with. Um, what do you think was the best thing that you had on your CV? Or I, I guess we should be more specific because CVs aren't used very often during your application. What what was was there a magic ingredient that worked for you? I'd say there wasn't um, any one thing that worked for me. I um, I didn't get pupillage straight away. It was a four year process for me, and um, so I applied four times, um, and. By the end of it, I think I had, it was a project. I, I sort of approached it like a military campaign, to be honest. Okay. Um, and having gone on to, to sit on pupillage committee before, the, the areas that we looked at um, in the pupillage committee were advocacy experience, legal experience, life experience, and academic ability. And looking back, by the time I got pupillage, I had quite a high level of experience in each of those areas. Um, and it, for me, um, it was very much a process of identifying what my strengths were and what my, what, and making the most of those and identifying what my weaknesses were and finding a way to compensate those. Um, so, so if you can take the the Kalia applying for your first batch, if you like, of your first application batch and the Kalia applying for your fourth year of application batch, what was the difference between those two people in terms of those qualities and experiences you've you've mentioned? I think it, the, the quality and, and depth of my experience was, was totally different between the first batch and, and the second and, and the last batch. Also, the confidence that I had by the time I was drafting my written applications and also in interview, I was just a much more f finished project. I was much more ready for it by that point. Um, and, and I think that can come across. 
um, in your applications. But for example, by the time I f I got my pupillage application, I had a two one in from Leeds, not a first from Oxford, but I also had a master's in public international law from Leiden University. I had um, done legal experience in a number of law firms, but I was working um, in an NGO and two NGOs. <laughs> um, and I'd also been assistant um, at Garden Court um, and I had, was, had run an MP's office by that point. Um, and I'd, I'd been involved in a number of, of advocacy, um, a number of advocacy competitions, but you have to remember, I'm not, I didn't have a first from Oxford. I wasn't highly connected in the legal world. Um, I'd never won an ad, won an advocacy competition ever. Um, you know, a foreign name, uh, there. I think this is all a race where we're not necessarily starting at the same point, but you, there are things you can do to maximize your, your chance of success. And I simply took every chance I could to maximize my success. And every year I improved on, on the year before until it, in my, what, what I tried to create was an unassailable argument for why I should be getting pupillage. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, Tom, um, how how did the we've heard about um, Kalia with an incredible level of determination? I'll, I'll ask Kalia about that in, in a moment. But um, were you did you fall on your feet as it were straight away, or did you did you struggle in the same way? Did you have to build up your experience? No, much like Kalia, I was a third time applicant when I got pupillage. So the first year I applied, I was doing the, the bar course and my applications at that point hadn't quite figured out mm. what my unassailable argument was, as Kalia puts it. And I think that's a really good way of putting it. You are presenting an overall picture of yourself to the, uh, the, the, applicant, uh, the uh, pupillage committees uh, when you're applying and you really need to have covered all of your bases. Um, by the time I got pupillage, third time round, I had figured out what my unassailable argument was. And that is part of the process. It's not just making the argument, but it's actually figuring out for yourself what that argument is for you. So your key selling point, is it, I've got loads of advocacy experience, or I've got loads of life experience, or is it, I have, um, a first from Oxford and I've done marshalling with a high court judge or something like that, you know, you've got to figure out for yourself what it is that's the key point of your unassailable argument. Um, and I think that does take time. So for me, it certainly took all those times. I think Carly is right when she says, once you get pupillage, you feel like you're, you're ready. And in a real sense, you only need to succeed once. So, um, it is part of that kind of process, a military camp or a process. It's, yeah, it, it, very similar to my own experience of uh, the pupillage application process. So it's almost like there's an invisible line that you cross, almost like with advocacy in some way. I think with advocacy, you suddenly realise the invisible line is when you, you actually start to enjoy it. And that's when I think it's been successful. You realise you're actually being able, you're able to persuade someone. Yes. Um, what was the, uh, you suddenly get this feeling of, of confidence. What was that ingredient for you then that, that made the difference? For me, I, I'd been to Cambridge and got a 2-1. And so I had a good academic background and I felt that coming out of the bar course, I'd set that foundation. But the thing I needed was advocacy experience and to be able to demonstrate that I had life experience. Because if you've gone through that process of going to a good school and then going to Oxford and straight onto the bar course, you, if you're applying in an area, for example, like crime, you're going to have to deal with difficult people and you need to be able to explain to the panel why you're a good person who's going to be able to interact with them and, and relate to them and they're going to be able to trust you. Um, mm. If you're from a completely different background, that's difficult. So um, that, that was one of the things I really needed to work on throughout that process. Uh, and what I did was I did two years of county court advocacy, um, which doing two years of it gave me that advocacy experience straight off. I'd done mooting in the past, but 
county court advocacy is a different level um, and what it added to my mooting experience was that life experience um, dealing with all sorts of people having to speak to them find out what their concerns were uh, and the best way of putting them before the court um, being fair and dealing with ethical issues at court things like that uh, that you need to be able to demonstrate as part of your unassailable argument so it, it was that two-year experience and I think even at the end of one year I hadn't hadn't quite got got there um, and I did need the full sort of well, I suppose it was 18 months when I was doing the interview that I'd been doing LPC for but I, I needed all of that experience uh, and I think when you've when you've got to that position when you start pupillage you'll see actually yes I'm so glad that I have that experience because it's put me in better stead for starting pupillage so it's not just about the application process it is about thinking about how how I'm going to be as a pupil barrister as well. That's really helpful. Um, Malka, I'm just delighted to, to see you. I'm glad you got your camera working. Yes, yeah, sorry, I had to log out for a moment or two, so I may have missed something, um, but no, no. it's okay. Well, we, I was just talking about, um, I was asking Carlia and Tom about what they think they had on their CV that made, made a real difference. Uh, and we've heard uh, in their answers really about uh, their uh, how, how unsuccessful I think at, at first they were but actually the amount of experience they gained through that process that really gave them the confidence to succeed and, and actually uh, and produced a, a successful result. So for you did you have a similar experience were you successful successful straight away or did you have a a, a bit of a similar struggle towards pupillage i could perhaps add to what tom has said um everybody has the grades everybody has the education they've either been to a russell group university or Oxford, cambridge um so you need something that makes you stand out and for me it was also county court advocacy um, after two years of being a county court advocate, that's when I managed to obtain pupillage. Um, but my journey was sort of a bit wishy-washy the way I ended up in a pupillage. Um, but I'm sure that that could probably be answered in, in, in one or two of your next questions, because I know we've heard quite a lot. I don't want to repeat what Tom said. No, no, not, not at all. Um, so how long did it take you, just to, to, if we can add to what we've heard already, Malka, um, did you succeed at the first op opportunity or did you fight, fight the good fight as it were and, and take a little bit longer? Uh, I fought the good fight and then I gave up and then I returned to it. So if I could uh, briefly outline, I the first year I applied and I had absolutely zero uh, success because all I had on my CV was just my educational um, attainments and no particular achievements of work experience or anything like that. So the second year I applied again on the gateway, which used to be limited to 12 applications. I think now it, it's gone up to 20. So a um, bit more than that. So just limited myself to 12. And at that point, um, although a lot of people around me hadn't secured pupillage, I felt insecure. That was the first time in my life that I'd sort of hit a point of failure. And it was very difficult to overcome when you sort of, always been achieving well, always been in the top bracket, and you sort of sort of lose self-confidence in yourself. And that's when I decided to do the LPC and cross over. Having done the LPC, having then been offered a training contract, I decided to give pupillage another go. Um, but by this time, in the background, I'd, I'd attained lots of life experience, I had travel experience, I had work experience, experience dealing with council, county court work, and so on. So I sort of built myself as a person. And in that year, I did 98 applications because I thought I'm going to go all in. Out of 98 applications, I, if I remember correctly, I had 40 first round interviews and 20 second round interviews and then three offers um so it was a case of apply 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 um but don't be disheartened when you receive that rejection because when one door closes another door opens and of course my story will be never give up i i tried to give up and it, it called me back I love that. You, you try to give up. <laughs> <laughs> I was we, I, 
I, I'm, there's a really interesting theme developing here, but uh, I've just noticed a couple of questions. So uh, one specifically for you, Carly, and one specifically for you, Tom. So Carly, if I can ask you first, um, it, it raised um, a number of uh, uh, interesting uh, questions about when you mentioned you had a, a foreign name and I think your perception that that might work against you. Could you elucidate a little bit more, expand a little bit more on that? Sure. Um, I think there is m more effort, especially in recent years, to try and address any unconscious bias that may exist in the pupillage process. So, for example, at my chambers that I um, that I got pupillage at, they removed the names of all the ad the names of all of the applicants from the um, pupillage applications um, and anything that was identifying, for example, if they went to state school or not, to try and avoid any conscious or unconscious bias that may exist. Yeah. And I don't know if all chambers do that, but I think that unconscious bias can exist because um, we are we are human and i think that there are humans who are conducting the application process and i think that there is sometimes an inclination to want to pick people who are like you and at the moment the you know the bar is not um as diverse as it could be and efforts are being made but it's not as diverse as it could be um and so i think that sometimes if there is a name like you know, like Christopher Kessling or Tom Walsford, the 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 person who's doing that sift may have an idea in their mind of what that person is, or or have certain pre preconceptions about what that yeah. person might be like. Whereas if they have a name like Carly Lykergu or Malka Afsal, they may have more different preconceptions about what mm. we may be like. Um, mm. And I think it's 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 either conscious or unconscious bias. And I don't think it's something that is prohibiting, but it's not necessarily something that inches you forward in the race. Mm. That that's my view on it. I don't know. That's, that's, that's very helpful. In fact, it's an, it's an approach that that we take at the ICCA on our bar course, where we redact uh, information relating to name, school, university, and, and all protected characteristics. Really, for precisely the reasons that, that you've mentioned, to, coupled with. Uh, unconscious bias training as well. So uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done. And for anyone that's really further interested in equality and diversity at the bar, and there's a, a lot to be discussed, as Carly has mentioned, we in fact have a session on that uh, later today with some uh, very, very, uh, with some excellent speakers. Uh, Tom, I said I had a specific question for you. You've probably seen it. And, and uh, you made mention of two years doing your county court experience how, how do you get experience like that so i applied to one of the national firms i was doing it for lpc who are based in london but i think i think they're the biggest one nationwide and they have about 190 to 200 advocates across the country so they're huge um and uh, it's really good really good experience but there are plenty of other firms out there so i ended up doing other work for i think a firm based in cardiff called uh, jeffrey's um, but that there are plenty of firms out there that, that offer it. You just need to do your research on that. Um, I can't remember all the names uh, off the top of my yeah. head, but yeah, that that was very straightforward. I applied, uh, I think, in the summer after finishing the bar course uh, and got started in the September. So it was about four months after uh, I had done my first round of applications uh, or had had my rejections from those applications. The the um, yeah, it's very interesting. I, I mean, I, 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 because you have a real client, don't you? When you're you're doing this, you're actually immersing yourself in in the system. It's it's not detached in the way that uh, a mini pupillage is or meeting experience is. You're actually doing it the, the proper job, if you like. I mean, I think pro bono experience. I'd be interested to, to for all of you uh, whether it's free representation unit or work through advocate, which was the par pro bono unit, or through county court practice. Um, these are really, really solid things to have in your CV, aren't they? Uh, Malka, what do you think? Um, I absolutely agree. And also, to, I think I noticed some of the comments as well, to gain more experience, um, I would gear towards court work and 
county court advocacy work as opposed to mini pupillages and um, I noticed that in a lot of my interviews they weren't interested in whether you'd done a mini pupillage or them it was sort of like a tick box exercise as long as you've done one in your life um, even though in bar school they drill it in your head do a mini pupillage do a mini pupillage I found it didn't really matter what mattered was do you know how a court works have you been inside a court have you shadowed people inside court so you can approach many firms that do for example county court work um, and either tag along to shadow them or in fact you can apply to be a county court advocate with them and that's what I did I was working as a county court advocate for a local firm um, but realized quite quickly there are many firms that are looking for those that have done the BPTC therefore have the rights of audience to do small claims and um, hearings uh, repossession hearings stage three hearings things like that yeah. Can I, I think can I add to that mini pupillage? Sorry, Carly. Yes, please do. Can I add to that mini pupillage point? I, I agree. It's not just about getting as many mini pupillage as you can, because often it's just a box on the paper. Yeah. Um, on the paper sift. Have you have you done? You know, couple. But I do. Th I think there can be a value to mini pupillages when you're filling out. Um, that other box on the um, on the form, which is why this chambers. If you've done a mini pupillage at that chambers, then you can obviously say, I, I went and shadowed blah blah, and you know that's another reason why I'm applying to you. Um, but there are other ways of of answering that question. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's that's really helpful. It's interesting because uh, I think there's still a feeling, you know, that. The, the three M's, mooting, marshalling, mini pupillage, you know, if you've got those particular things ticked on your CV, you're away. But but the theme that's developed in this conversation is it's actually an awful lot more than that. This is this is about a combination of, of key skills, isn't it? Yeah. And a combination that actually take quite a long time to, to, to get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, just in, in response to Sunny, I think she's just directed a question. I just wanted to say, they, if you're in sort of down south, then there's the FRU, which is the Free Representation Unit. Um, in Manchester, we have the PSU, which is the Personal Support Unit. It gives you a feel for the court. That That's what I mean by getting to know court work and the, the different courts. If Tom can add anything as well, because I'm sure he's experienced it recently. In terms of court work, yeah, L LPC yeah. Uh, d does it slightly differently because there's a, there's a you do your essentially just with county court stuff. Um, you get your rights of audience via being supervised by a solicitor, so it's slightly different to being fully on your feet. And actually, one of the questions I was asked in an interview once was, "Well, you've been doing LPC for two years. Why do you want to be a barrister? Why aren't you happy doing that?" So you have to have answers for things like that because it is subtly different. Yeah, that's really helpful. The other theme that, that has come across really clearly for, from all of you is determination. Um, and I love the way, Malka, that you, you said you tried to give up, but you were dragged back kicking and screaming back to the bar whether you liked it or not. Um, Carlia, how do you how do you deal with, and I think it's something that we all have to, to deal with when we're applying for the bar, how do you deal with the concept of what seems like failure when it happens? It's really hard, really, really hard, because I think a lot of people who have got to that point have not experienced repeated failure like that before. And yeah. I think it is very difficult not to tie your self-esteem to becoming a barrister um, and achieving this goal that you have set for yourself. And you cannot help but look around you at all the other people who are getting it. And when you walk into that interview room and feel, you know, some intimidated or, or whatever, um and i for a long time really did time my self-esteem to it and it was very difficult but i i was i was reflecting on this before i came in and there is that churchill quote which is you know when you're going through hell just keep going because i mean i i knew i wanted to be in law i didn't want to be um i wanted to be qualified i wanted that piece of paper um and i'd committed to this 
you know my grandma had that bloody picture of me from you know cool on a table and I had to, and it, I didn't want to embarrass myself but, you know not getting it in the end um so so I, I I kept going and um you find this sort of focus and I I just became very determined not to tie my self-esteem to this and actually the year I got it was the year I said that's that's the end as soon as I finished um my my pupillage applications i immediately started preparing the application to transfer and do the lpc um but i didn't have to do it in the end yeah uh, i heard you say in your acceptance speech for your uh, recent award for international woman of the year that everyone should learn the words to don't rain on my parade <laughs> I, I i on honestly i've i've mentioned that song in more than one interview much to my embarrassment but i mean it's it's a really <laughs> powerful song. Um, <laughs> it's Barbara Streisand, Don't Rain On My Parade. I used to like play it to like rev myself up before interviews as well. <laughs> well I think it's, I think it's fa fantastic. Tom, how about you? Because you similarly uh, had a lot of knockbacks and, and I guess you have to learn to roll with the punches to some extent. Yeah, I think I think there's, um, you really have to approach it in a way you would any other sort of stumbling block in life. Um, so you, you've obviously looking ahead, you're going to apply again if you're, if you really want it and you have to think what you're going to do in the year in between in order to get yourself ready. And probably by the time you've got all of the rejections through, you'll, you'll have less than a year because the applications are due in, uh, in, in the winter and you'll have your final interviews in maybe as late as June. So you've got six months to get yourself back on essentially and you need to figure out what you what you're going to do but that's only part of the story because you do have to recognize that you've suffered a defeat to some extent and you need to essentially feel your feels is the phrase my wife would use um uh, and perhaps think about other things that are going well um take your mind off the application process don't let it engross every year don't sit there one year to the next waiting for january to come around to submit your applications you know crack on with your life and do other things because that will help you as much as anything in in the search for pupillage we've we've all talked about how you need life experience well get on get on with other things don't don't let it consume you absolutely. um and, and do that straight away you know um because you, yeah. the application process is consuming if you submit your applications in january You'll be waiting uh, as soon as you've submitted them you'll be wanting to know and you'll be refreshing emails for the um, interview uh, offers and such um, and so it does consume a lot of time in the first part of the year and then once you're in the interview process you'll be using those spare moments to prepare um, enjoy the enjoy the time off when you're not thinking about pupillage applications um, and get on with other things um, yeah. in terms of actually well, that, that Sorry. Well, I was going to say, in terms of actual kind of overall points for dealing with the disappointment, I think I think you have to be realistic. Um, we, we've all spoken about the difficulties we've had, and it's not straightforward. Um, I think you need to look back on your previous applications and be critical, but also pick out the good things from them um, and cherish any encouragement you get from people you meet on the way, if that's other barristers or, or barristers or members of chambers or, or judges if you're doing county court work. Um, I was really fortunate to, a week after my final rejection in first in the, the second time round, be before a district judge who said, well, this is probably the first time you've failed at something, isn't it? I imagine that's quite hard to take. And I was, I was taken aback by it, but he hit the nail on the head and nobody had really put it in those words. And it's something Carly has already um, mentioned. Um, I think you've you really got to cherish the encouragement you get from people on the way uh, and take your mind off it don't let it consume you yeah that, that's really good good advice uh, uh, and malka similar experience where you you almost well you had made the conscious decision that actually the bar wasn't going to work out for you Absolutely. um you went to do your, your lpc what grabbed hold of you and you know like a huge magnet from afar started dragging you back to the bar it was a mixture of sort of three or four things um the first would be the fact that i thought if i'm capable of securing a training contract within at this moment in time um 
am I capable of securing pupillage, which is ultimately what I wanted to do and about is what I wanted to become. So I gave it a try effectively. But in order to, it's sort of, you set yourself up to fail as well because you know in you know you're not you're going to get a, a lot of rejections but it's about changing that mindset and telling yourself you are going to succeed you are going to succeed. keep going keep going keep going um but i think it was knowing that there was a backup for me uh which made it a little bit easier but as as carly and tom have have pointed out um it's the unfortunate arrogant truth it's the first time you hit failure and that's why it's so hard to cope with and that's why after a couple of years you sort of want to walk away but to add something that would probably be very meaningful to those those that are, are listening um i would rec recommend applying all year round as opposed to waiting for the gateway i yeah i limited myself in the first two years just waiting for the gateway the, the the time that I did secure pupillage that year, it was as soon as something popped up in my area that I was interested in. Um, I mean, I was prepared to to even relocate if necessary. Um, but I applied everywhere, and that's the advice I'd give: don't limit yourself to January. It's not January; it's all year round. Yeah, it's, it's a, for those that don't know, the pupillage gateway opens for applications between early January and early February each year. So it's a very defined uh, sort of narrow window, isn't it? Um, so if you say you don't do that, um, what, do you, what, what, what approach did you take, Malka? Did you just apply direct to Chambers in the home? Absolutely. I, in fact, even hand wrote some letters to Chambers and surprisingly was welcomed in, which was an unusual approach. Um, but I'd say each of the handwritten letters that I wrote took me quite far they're the ones that I got an interview in so if you have the option to handwrite a letter handwrite that letter uh, it's usually a covering letter with a CV if they've given you an option take it they they really want to see if you can express yourself in on a piece of paper without you know typing 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 retyping um, and also it shows that you know this is uniquely built to, for their chambers um, but there is one one downfall. I mean, I wouldn't recommend everybody sort of do the BPTC and then do the LPC as a backup because it's very difficult to then explain your commitment. So you sort of dug a hole for yourself and a bit of a trap because a lot of the biggest question I would get would be is, hang on, you've done the LPC, make your mind up. Do you want to be a solicitor or do you want to be a barrister? Are you taking this seriously? Um, so you have to be very careful when when sort of deciding to do the LPC at the same time as a BPTC because I notice a few people have written in the group chat oh so is it worth doing the two that that's not my advice that was just my circumstances that's really interesting okay thank you uh, let's move on to um, Carly if you can help with with this so what's that feeling like when you actually get you're shortlisted, you actually get an interview. Um, fear? Fear, oh, there's all of it really. You just, um, I don't know, it's sort of like dominoes toppling, like things are just ticking as you want them to. It's the absence um, of, of crushing disappointment um, <laughs> and the onset of, of fear. I just felt like every single interview before I was going into it like an athlete yeah. and, I, and I sort of approached it like that Okay. prepared myself for each one. So it's quite commonplace um, to, for chambers, there's no set formula, but some chambers have uh, uh, their, their interviews in two rounds, yeah. a sort of first round sieving exercise and a, which shortlists the, the candidates for the second round. Some do it all in one. Have Some have more, just to extend the pain a little bit some more. Some even um, have an excruciatingly your... difficult written exercise before even meeting you or interviewing you, just to sift out the best of the best. Um, but I just, just forgot to add this to my point earlier. Even if you get an interview, you should be so proud of yourself because there are sort of three to 400 people applying to each role and they're only interviewing 20 people. So you've whittled yourself down from a list of about 300 to 20. 
And then, of course, if you get to second round, then it's almost an achievement in itself. And that's what did keep me going is is writing on my calendar with a massive green tick, got a first round. And that that was good enough for me. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's important to, um, we're talking about dealing with failure, but it's important to recognise success, even partial success, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, um, Tom, if I can just move to you, what sort of people, uh, sorry, what sort of uh, interview experiences did, did you have? Were most of yours in two rounds or was it just a... A mishmash of all, all manner of things. There was quite a variety. Um, most chambers do two, um, at least. Um, some do an interview day. Um, so I had I had a couple where you do uh, an initial interview where they'd perhaps have eighty people in at different times, and then you'd go back on a on a second day and have two interviews. If you got through the first one, you'd go into the second one. Um, so in, in the final one, they'd have sort of 15 or 10 people going for four places and they'd be really whittling it down. Uh, but at other places, it was just one and then another uh, on a separate day. Um, there was a massive variety in my experiences of the interview days and the interview process. Some were very, very good. And in fact, I think the, the James I ended up at was the best experience. Um, a member of the committee came out beforehand and there was only ever one person waiting to go in um, he shook that yeah. he shook everybody's hand um, and told them what was going to be in the interview how many people were there uh, what level of call they were so you were fully prepared for what to what was going to happen uh, and you felt like they were welcoming you and interested in you um, and at the other end of the spectrum some very, 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 very poor experiences. My my worst experience was getting to Chambers on time for a 7.30 interview. I must have got there about 7.15 to find 30 people in the waiting room. And uh, that we were just in a tiny, tiny area about uh, 20 meters square or something like that. It was, it was tiny. And um, I didn't actually get my interview until 9.20 in the evening. Wow. So I was waiting around for nearly two and a half hours or two hours, I suppose. Um, and I had no contact with anybody from the from the panel beforehand. And you're there with uh, essentially your competition, but your peers. Um, uh, and it, it was excruciating. And I think mm -hmm. dealing with the pre interview sort of pupil waiting room is part of the challenge of the interviews as much as the interview themselves. Yes. Um, people warned me that there would be people who boast about their achievements in, in the waiting room. I, I didn't see so much of the boasting, but there is certainly talk about what people have done. Um, I don't think I don't think I saw many people who were deliberately mean. And I would encourage you not to be those people because there will be secretaries who are sitting at the desk noting down anybody who's being awful. Um, and that's not it's not a, it's not an appropriate way to behave. It's not what the bar's about. The bar's about collegiality and supporting each other Absolutely. can can i add to that and say that when we were doing um organizing pupillage interviews at three temple gardens which is where i got my pupillage um we uh specifically asked the um the people who was welcoming everyone in to make a note of what the conduct was like um while they were waiting to come into the interview rooms so make sure you are in your best behavior yeah, um, that, that's that's really good advice. I've I've heard a lot of stories anecdotally about precisely that people coming out of an interview that actually went very well from a panel perspective, only for that panel to find out that their behaviour outside the pupil room was was really quite poor in a number of ways. So that's that's really quite helpful. Um, uh, how about you, Carlia? Did you have any uh, any really great experiences of interviews and any really poor experiences? Um, there was an interview that I walked out of. Um, it, it was from a firm in Manchester. It was one of those applications that came up outside the bar, um, the gateway cycle, and it was... Mm a slightly dodgy chambers and when I arrived there it just seemed like there it hadn't been any paper sift um and they we were being sort of assessed in rounds 
Right. And I think the second or third round, um, and, and it seemed as though there weren't going to be any barristers either assessing us, just assistance. And at the point at which I saw that they'd been spelling um, pupillage wrong, I just thought this isn't where I want to. Okay. This isn't where I want to do my training. Um, and so I didn't yeah. stick with that one. Um, well, that's a really interesting point because I, I think it's, uh, for me, I've, I've always approached interviews like this. I think as much of it because it makes me less nervous when I go in. But, you know, I like to think of them as a two way street. You know, you're assessing the chambers as well as them assessing you. What, what's your view about that? Um, I mean, when I've discussed this with my partner, who's also at the bar, he said he would have stayed because once you've got your you know once you've got your foot in the door you've got your foot in the door you can move yeah. you can go wherever you want um i think i just didn't want to be associated with any chambers because once that was on my connected to me it was connected to me and i just didn't i didn't feel comfortable um in terms of good pupilaging pup, um, interview experiences i'd say they're the ones where you when you get offers i mean uh, there was one I walked out of and just thought, nailed it, and then yeah. <laughs> didn't get an offer. Um, so one where you can answer the questions and you feel quite good afterwards, that's a good yeah. interview. So, so Malka, you've been through, probably most recently through the, the pupillage application process. What sort of questions were you, were you, were there any questions that really spring to mind that you found really, really difficult the or what, some that you felt um, questions just range you could not predict a question so it was a victory if you went in there and had predicted a question and prepared for it that that was one of those small victories that that you would just sort of revel in afterwards but um questions range from what's your favorite superhero and why you you can't prepare for that um i think another one which i will never forget and i don't don't want to name the chambers but it was um if you could pick a disney character which one would it be and why and it sort of threw me off and then i realized that was the point it was to throw you off um but yeah questions range from from things like that just to try and test how good quick you are on your feet all the way through to not technical but basic legal arguments like um are you for or against the death penalty often you would get they would want to see some kind of debating technique so you would always get a for or against um but having done so many interviews um they vary they absolutely vary there's no one particular formula to what to expect um but there is one formula for how one should behave and that is just always treat it as you want this chambers um once you've decided that it's the one for you because as soon as you start saying oh I'm, I'm floating around i'm not sure which one i want they lose interest in you yeah yeah that's really really helpful tom it, it, probably quite a difficult question but is there any technique for preparing for an interview yes um i think there is i think the starting point um is to go back to your application so you'll get an interview perhaps um, in late February or, or March. You might have done things in the interim. You need to go back to the application, look at it and go through. Is there anything you've done since you need to add to the application? Is there anything Chambers have announced since? Look at that. Um, think about new developments in the area that you're applying to. Um, you, you can prepare full answers to, for example, one year, um, the question that came up in every interview was about the parole board and John Warboys. Um, in my first year, there was a question about Operation U Tree, which was uh, the operation which followed the Jimmy Savile scandal, essentially. Um, I fumbled my way through an answer in first year. The same question came up in third year, and I had a fully prepared answer on both sides. You can prepare for questions like that, you, and, and you should do. You should have um, a crib sheet with all your answers you can write them fully out and then know them by heart essentially um, and you can prepare for the more basic questions as well why do i want to get pupillage why you know why do i want to be a barrister why this chambers uh, and you really should when you're preparing for an interview think about why this chambers that is critical um, because you will be asked that question um, and i think you should go back once you've done interviews go back look at what went well look at what went badly and don't shy away from what went badly uh, really look well why was that answer not great you know why did i have a brain yeah. freeze on that 
um, uh, and and learn f for the next one. Um, you can think about the exercises you'll be asked to do in crime. It's going to be a bail application or a plea mitigation. You can you can look those up in in Archbold's when you're on the bar course. You'll have a copy of Archbold's and you'll be doing those applications in advocacy sessions. Yeah. So you can yeah. you can prepare but fully um, in advance of the interview. Yeah. Can I add a tip? Can I add a couple of tips yeah. on? on, on Please um, do. I think it was. Uh, I think it was my um, like Middle Temple Students Association or, or somewhere that has a list of questions that you're likely to be asked in interview, including things like why do you want to be a barrister? Why this chambers? Um, what is it you like about advocacy? All that, all that kind of thing. So I'd gotten that list and I had worked out answers to all of those questions. And then I was also prepared to answer questions about anything that was on my CV. So if I referred to example, I don't know, sh shadowing someone or having done something I'd done in Cambodia, I was prepared to answer in depth questions about that. And then with some of these more esoteric questions, you know, I had some answers to those. I'd thought about who I wanted at my main dinner party. You know, and once you start having, you know, some answers to that, you can connect the dots as well and it becomes a little bit easier. And you also have to stay current as well because, it, it, yeah. you know, once you've done that the first time, some of them will be easier because you've already got them prepared for the next year. But you also have to stay current. What are the legal, the main legal issues that are going on in the day? And when it comes to the advocacy yeah. exercises, I had... Um, you know, used my friends who'd gotten pupillage as a resource and got um, and got them to do a couple of advocacy sessions with me. So by the time I went into my last advocacy session, I had a plan for how I would handle a plea and mit and a plan for how I would handle a bail app. Mm -hmm. So I just applied it when, when I was confronted with it. That's really helpful. Malcolm, what advice have you, we've heard from Paul Yeah, Charlie. and what my advice partner have you just got? reminds me as well, because he was there throughout the procedure of, of me applying. He said, you just have pages and pages of notes. Tell them about all those notes. Um, yeah, I literally used to, five main questions. Why do you want to be a barrister? Why this chambers? What makes you stand out? The, stand, the standard five, I would, that are all on the gateway anyway prepare for them and uniquely prepare for them for this particular set but more importantly see what uh, the current affairs are so at my time it was knife crime and surprisingly it came up often so I prepared are we pro knife crime are we against knife crime what do we think of the new rules for knife crime so really look up the news and pick out what's what's current what's main and it's likely yeah. to come up and the third um Obviously, for, if you had an advocacy exercise, you will be told how and, and what to do with that one. So I won't I won't talk in depth about that. But the third piece of preparation is um, I actually used to pick up the phone before the interview and I used to ask if I could speak to people on the pupillage committee. And very often the answer would be no. But sometimes they'd, they'd give you a warm welcome and they'd, they'd say to you, right, our interview process involves X, Y, Z. And if I wasn't successful on the phone, I would send an email in requesting a copy of their pupillage policy. And then you sort of get a feel for it because sometimes they write in there, we ask five set questions or we ask, you know, they put a bit of information in that policy. I don't know if I'd advise that for every set. Some sets yeah. might, might not welcome that because they might think mm. you're a bit of a pain. Um, yeah, to ring up. But it depends on it, it can depend on the set. I think there are forums where you might get an insight about what the pupillage process is for that chambers. And I think use your mates who have gotten pupillage ahead of you as a resource as well. That's really helpful. Um, we've got to, to 1250. I just want to ask each of you this question uh, because we've heard about this such interesting uh the journeys you've all been on to get to pupillage carlia what did it feel like for you oh when you got it oh my god it was like i don't know all the angels singing and like oh, it, was, it was the best thing ever and Barbara Barbara Spicer Spicer singing, singing as well i there, suspect Bette midler was there it was, it was fantastic <laughs> i meant bet midler yeah absolutely and tom how about you how did it feel for you absolutely elated it's it's very difficult 
to describe just how incredible it is to get there because you've made it your focus for so long. Um, it's relief yeah. and yeah. confusion because immediately you're getting flashbacks to the interview and you're thinking, oh, that went so well. I'm not surprised I got it. And all of that sort of disappointment and, and from the failures that you've had before, you think, well, of course I got it this time because it went so well. And, and you get the complete reversal and yeah. you think, well, I'm amazing. I'm great. So you get all of that at once and it's fantastic. Fabulous. Uh, and Malka, how about you? How did it feel when you secured people? Uh, it, it made me accept and believe in deferred gratification. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> Well, do you know, it, it's been an absolute uh, delight uh, and thank you to all of you, to Carlia, to Tom and to Malka for attending today. Uh, and I hope uh, for all of you that these insights have been really valuable. Uh, I think that authentic experience really counts for everything. And we've heard so many interesting themes developing today. So I hope you can take away from that. And, and uh, I wish all of you real success. I think it's been proved today uh, that with some time, effort and self-belief that you actually can succeed, uh, even if, like Malka, you choose it, it's not going to be for you. It, sometimes it comes back and it drags you back in. So thank you all. It's been a real pleasure. And thank, take you. Care. thank you. I'll, I'll move over to networking for a little bit if anyone wants to ask questions. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.